Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, filling in for Leslie, who is unable to make it today. Hope you all don't mind. And my guest today is Nick Randolph, and we're going to be talking about the Uno platform. Hey, Nick, how are you? Hey, Robert, how are you? how's things, mate? Great. Welcome to the show. You are in Australia, where it's quite late. <laughs> is it, that right? it, it, late or early? It's about five a.m. in the morning. Um, oh, so, awesome! But, uh, well, one of the one of the so benefits of working for a uh, multinational company is uh, yeah. we keep strange hours. So, thank you so much for dragging yourself out of bed this early in the morning to come <laughs> on the show. <laughs> uh, it's all good, mate. It's all good. It's all good. So, Uno is one of our favorite topics. Uh, we've had. Uh, you guys on multiple times. We like whenever there's a new release to do one of these shows. Um, and today we're going to do another one. This is your first time joining us. So I want you to do a brief introduction of who you are for anybody who doesn't really know you yet. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Nick Randolph, I've been working for, with the Uno team for a couple of years now. Um, a bunch of across a bunch of the technologies. I'm based here in Sydney. I've been a developer in the Microsoft space almost as long as Microsoft has been do doing mobile and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So I remember the old days of you know Pocket PC, Windows Mobile, all of that jazz, um, uh, and, and an MVP in the sort of the Windows development camp as well. So um, I guess today's session is going to be a bit of an update on where the Unit platform is, you know, some mm -hmm. of the new technology that we've got, um, and and some of the, the updates that we've got coming as well. So. But for those of people who maybe aren't familiar with the Uno platform, um, it is a cross-platform technology. So it's a it's a toolkit if you have uh, for building applications that can really just about run anywhere. So mobile, web, desktop, you know, even in some embedded solutions. Um, and so we we aim to be more than just the the bare bones. So you know, part of what we'll talk about today is the the platform aspect of the Uno platform. It's sort of the the various toolkits and extensions that can be package with you or included in your application to sort of you know improve the experience make it easier and quicker to build you know high quality applications so, and, so. okay and it's based on xaml so it's xaml and c sharp and it builds apps that run on windows macs androids ios devices which yeah, exactly kind of sounds like what maui does so <laughs> yeah it's not it's not too dissimilar um look we, we've got Obviously, the same heritage. We're in the .NET ecosystem. We're all based on, you know, .NET for iOS, .NET for Android, you know, Windows app SDK, those types of, tech, you know, base level of technology. So, you know, the the approach to building stuff is different. Um, you know, the the Maui one basically takes their, you know, their own abstraction over everything, whereas the Uno direction is geared by Win, Win UI. It used to be UWP, but it's now okay. Win UI. And so we think of that as almost like the specification for how we abstract over the rest of the remaining platforms. You know, but but we also target, you know, a wider ecosystem as well. So we do web and we do Linux and, you know, so it's a, it's, it's definitely a, a singular tool set that allows you to deliver applications to where your customers are. Okay. So obviously if you have been doing UWP, WinUI, then it's the same XAML and you don't need to learn a new XAML. And that's a great choice. If you've been, if you've grown up in the Xamarin XAML, then Maui seems pretty similar. So you might not switch over, um, but yeah. when might you, why might you? And then if the follow would be, if you don't know any XAML at all and you want to go down this route, how would you decide which one to choose? Uh, so great stories in both scenarios. Um, so there are some scenarios, obviously, where you may want to leave the sort of the Xamarin Forms Maui kind of world and, and, and you know, take on Uno. Um, and that can be quite a progressive thing. So, you know, we'll talk a little bit more later on about Maui embedding and how you can take advantage of that. Um, but, but definitely if you're looking at other platforms, um, so if you're looking at, say, supporting Linux and the web, um, definitely who knows there's the way to go um, okay. in, in that sort of space. Um, um, and for those people who don't particularly feel comfortable in XAML, um, they might have had bad experiences in it, or they might just like okay. to program in C Sharp. Um, we do actually have a, a technology called C Sharp Markup, um, which again, we'll drop into and have a, have a, have a bit of a look at. Um, okay. And that was one of the major releases in as part of the 5.0 sort of wave of features um, was this ability to basically have a C Sharp Markup, which does, delivers almost exactly the same functionality as the equivalent in XAML, but allows you to stick with a singular language um, whilst also taking advantage of obviously the, the native C sharp language features that are available to you. 
Okay. All right, cool. So let's switch to the new releases and what's new. Okay. Um, so if we just jump into it, um, so late last year, we released the Uno Platform 5.0 um, in line with the .NET 8 release. Um, in fact, it came a couple of weeks prior, just prior to it. Um, we do tend to try and stick to make sure that we have, you know, day-to-day -day release of, um, in sync with the .NET framework. Um, so we've got Net8 support now. We've literally just deprecated Net7 support in the sense of when you go to create a new application using the templates, it's no longer featured there as an option. But you know, if you are still building with .NET 7, you can still take advantage of the Uno platform. Um, and we're going forward, we'll, we do have some coming support for the .NET 9 previews. Um, so, you know, we already have our canaries taking advantage of that and, and making sure that we're already, you know, making sure that all of the latest builds will work against the, the you know, the changes coming in .NET 9. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of the biggest features points, obviously C Shell markup, which again, we'll drop into and have some, show some examples. Uh, we've got some, you know, great work in the, the Figma space to allow you to generate not just XAML, but also C Sharp markup directly from, you know, your, your Figma. Um, and that's basically some... essentially a drawing tool that will then create your XAML or your C Sharp, C -sharp markup for you, right? Yeah, exactly. And so this is really powerful for engaging in that early stage. You know, you've got a designer on board. They're able to basically knock out the designs for your various pages in Figma. Um, but the idea is you can then take those, develop them, come in, use the plugin to generate the XAML and C Sharp. Um, and it's done in such a way that you, you know, you can iteratively do that. And so the, the, it's almost like the designer in pairing with the developer takes responsibility for the markup. Uh, for your application. And then obviously it frees up the developer to spend more time focusing on the business logic, wiring up the data side of things um, without having to, to you know, worry too much about the design aspect. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, and look, we've got some improvements in, in just the overall dev experience. So we've got, you know, um, Hot Reload, that's obviously a, a capability delivered by Microsoft and, and you know, they've done their framework, but also, you know, for WinApp SDK and, you know, some of the other technologies already have some level of Hot Reload. Um, mm -hmm. Uno takes that to the next level and makes sure that the Hot Reload will work across all of the, the target platforms we have. So the mobile devices, the web, um, you can all leverage and uh, take advantage of Hot Reload. Um, and, it, and it really doesn't matter whether you're working in Visual Studio or VS Code, um, but the Uno Hot Reload has got you covered for that as well. So it's it's a major major improvement for the developer experience overall. So yeah. So um, Uno has a, an extension for VS Code as well, correct? We do. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So there's an is extension for. Or has that been around for a while? Um, well, it's it has been around for a while, but uh, okay. it's uh, it is it is relatively new. Um, obviously, the Visual Studio plugin has been been around longer. Um, yeah. But yeah, done a lot of work to support VS Code um, and and support developers in you know where they where they feel comfortable. So you know we've got mm -hmm. VS Code on across all of the you know different ecosystems, whether it be Windows, Mac, Linux. Um, we now got support for for building Uno platforms actually on the target platform that you want to target. Okay. So you can on a Mac load VS Code, load the Uno extension, and go to town. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this became super critical when uh, Microsoft decided to deprecate the Visual Studio for Mac. And so yes. we saw, you know, C Sharp support going across to, you know, the VS Code. <coughs> mm -hmm. Now he's obviously got their plugin for VS Code. You know, the Uno, you know, platform's got their um, support for it as well. And that gives you the, the usual things like IntelliSense for both XAML and C Sharp. You know, it gives you, as I mentioned, hot reload. Um, so it's it's a really good developer experience. And, you know, definitely there's a lot of work that's gone into making sure that that works everywhere the VS Code does. So Cool. Yeah. All right. Um, so the few, a few other things to go on top of that. Uh, we've got new workshops. Um, we've got a, a new Uno SDK. Um, so this is kind of like hidden from developers, sort of. Um, so most people are familiar with the, you know, the CS project file. You know, you have your SDK actually listed at the top. Most people don't even realize it's there. Um, mm -hmm. Uno's now got an SDK, and we've taken we're we're doing that to take advantage right. of some of the loading capabilities in Visual Studio that sort of prioritizes SDK features above you know, doing package restore and those types of things. Um, and, and this is actually sort of laying the groundwork for the next up and coming release, which is, um, 
uh, imminent. I, I won't put a timeline on it because we don't like to do that because it <laughs> freaks everyone out if we do that. Is that um, a 5X we, or a 6? It is still a 5X, so it's a point okay. release. Um, yeah. But it's 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 fairly significant in the sense of right now, as we'll see as we get into some of the demos, it, it's a number of different target platform projects that are created as part of the template. And the idea is that we want to rationalize that and bring that back down to something that's much simpler and much easier for developers to take advantage of, whilst improving the support within the tooling to actually support targeting the different platforms. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, we, we've seen this with, with Maui. So for example, if you create a new Maui application, single project, you can just use the switcher at the top to basically switch between iOS, Android, or Windows. And so we wanted to leverage that capability, but don't forget we've got more platforms to support. So you can imagine that there's a little, you know, pushing and pulling that we have to do of levers in order to get that to work. So, right. but uh, yeah, so imminent. Um, so it's going to be very, very good. Um, cool. Uh, we've got our live wizard. Um, so we'll see this is taking advantage of the wizard that we've had for quite a while, for really a, a, almost two years, I think now, um, for with this base within Visual Studio um, and actually making it available on the web um, so for people who are working in VS Code and Rider, um, they can actually use that to generate the command line that they can then use to generate the application. Um, and the reason why we need that is because there are actually a lot of different options as we'll see for the template. Um, and lastly on this list is the responsive view. So this is basically providing a sort of built-in support within the toolkit for you know, switching between say portrait and landscape and defining those different layouts um, individually. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see into it. Um, so the overall goal of the, of the unit platform is to be the most productive .NET platform. So we aim to be, you know, combination of flexible so we want to you know developers can build the tools where they where they feel most comfortable um, we want to make sure things are super productive so you know giving toolkits and extensions to sort of accelerate that development but yet we also want to be able to provide a rich interface um, and obviously make you make sure the applications are beautiful as well um, so we drill into that. Uh, we look at flexibility to start with. Um, so as I mentioned before, literally developers should come to us and say, you know, we want to build on Windows, we want to build on Linux, we want to build on Mac. So, you know, mm -hmm. the idea is that they can build with whatever OS they're, they're most comfortable with, with whatever IDE they're most comfortable using, whatever markup language they feel most comfortable with, whether it be XAML and C Sharp, um, they can use whatever state management system that they want to do, uh, want to use. Um, so out of the box, we already ha have support for NVM, which is quite a traditional XAML data binding uh, state management uh, technique. Uh, but we also have MVUX, which is our sort of more reactive approach to that. And of course, we want to be able to target any of the, the, the target platforms. So whether it be web, mobile, desktop, or embedded, um, and actually, just this week on Twitter, we actually saw somebody give a great example. Let me see if I can pull that up um, of an embedded system. Uh, let me see um, where you can actually see the Uno application running oh. on an embedded system. Nice. Uh, so, so the whole UI there is basically dri um, driven using using it. So, yeah, it's so pretty pretty cool yeah. to see that live in action on an embedded system, cool. right? Mm -hmm. so, Uh, and, and the idea is, look, at the end of the day, we're, we're designing to be extensible and modular. So if you have your own C-sharp library that you want to bring to the table, you can do that. You know, we are at the, at the, at the nuts and bolts of it. We're just a .NET library. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, you should be able to bring in your .NET library or controls components and you should be able to work comfortably with the platform. Okay, so we've, we've talked a little bit about this. Um, this is uh, C Sharp Markup versus XAML. <laughs> I shouldn't say versus because it's really horses for courses, right? So the idea here is that you should feel comfortable in either or both. Um, you can mix and match if you like. Um, chances are you won't from a team perspective. You'll pick one technology or the other. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea is that there shouldn't be anything you can do in XAML that you can't do in C Sharp and vice versa. Now, there are definitely cases where one is easier to do things. So, for example, if you have to use a switch statement to save picks between data templates, um, C Sharp actually has some nice capabilities just in the language for doing switch statements that make it easier to do that type of thing um, than necessarily in XAML. 
Um, I find XAML easier, but then again, I've been working with XAML for so many years right. that I'm, I'm super comfortable with it. Um, and I like that separation between my sort of declarative UI that XAML gives me and obviously the data binding for the back end. Um, but I do find that the, the you know switching back and forth between XAML and C-sharp markup is relatively straightforward because as you can see in this example, um, they're relatively the similar kind of in, in structure. So for example, if we go through here, we can see that this page is basically made up of a grid um, and you know it's got a couple of rows that are defined. You go down, if you've got a navigation bar, we've got a stack panel, text box and a button. So you mm -hmm. can actually make out similar elements in each of them. And so the basic translation here, or the, the, the way that this is structured is that, you know, what where you want to create an element, it's a new element. So you can see over here that we're newing up a grid, we're newing up a navigation bar, et cetera. And then when you're going to set a property on things, instead of it being a property, it's actually a method. So you can see here that, say, for example, on the stack panel, we're setting the horizontal alignment. So you see that we're actually calling the horizontal alignment method. Um, and this is all code generated. And so the advantage there is that, you know, if you're bringing in a third party library, um, so it may be a third party control or Windows Community Toolkit, for example, um, we can point the generator at that. Um, and you basically just add a single attribute to your application. We generate a bunch of code and all of a sudden now there's the control or the class that was, was originally written in XAML is now capable of being ingested and using it within a C-sharp markup environment. So, so, um, so I have a I have a question and then a viewer has a question. Sure. So we've all seen demos of GitHub Copilot writing code for you. You can put a comment on what you want and it spits out the code. So C sharp markup, would it be easier for GitHub Copilot to be able to spit out this UI code as C sharp markup versus expecting at some point GitHub Copilot could write the XAML? If I just um, look at what to, to do, it comes down to the training actually, because right now there's a, there's a lot of content out on the internet in terms of training and capabilities around XAML, and so if you go to Copilot today or to you know to ChatGPT or whatever your favorite AI tool is, um, and ask it to create a layout, you know, a page in XAML, you know, styled for WinApp SDK, uh, and you want uh, essentially a login prompt, so a username and password and a forgotten. Mm -hmm password button um it will actually come back with with fully formed xaml um, ah, okay so it can already do that can it do that from inside visual studio it can um, yep yeah, yeah. so so copilot's okay. able to do that so you're able to basically say you know give me the xaml for this type of thing and then you can just copy and paste it into your application um uh, <laughs> without wanting to promote my own blog um yeah i did actually have a i did a, a, a proof of concept of this a while ago um mm -hmm. just to see what it was capable of and i was actually genuinely surprised about you know just how good the xaml generation was now I, it wasn't a super complex example um but we you know we've tried it with you know a form that's got you know search capability with you know a list of items to return and stuff mm. like that okay. um, so it is able to do quite a lot of that sort of stuff now Going forward, would it be able to do the same with C-sharp markup? I, I think it would be able to. Um, I, it really comes down to the training set that's available for it. Um, okay. And so obviously the more documentation we get out as a team, um, the more coverage, the more examples it's got to sort of learn and train on, um, the more likely it's like to, to generate the, you know, the right outcome. Um, okay. Yeah. So. All right, so a couple of questions from our good friend, Fuel Snobble. How does Uno compare to WPF or Avalonia? Um, so in a lot of regards, the, the, the XAML syntax is fairly similar. Um, there's different features that are available in WPF that are not available in essentially WinApp SDK and WinUI um, and, and vice versa. Um, and so I, my, the way I would approach this, this is whether what you're most comfortable with, you should stick with. Like, so if you're a WPF developer, then, you know, that that may be where you want to stay. Um, but that's not to say that you can't migrate. And definitely if there's reasons why you want to migrate. So, for example, you want to target those additional platforms like the web, um, et cetera. Uno is a great candidate for that. Um, and definitely the migration of WPF code across is going to be relatively straightforward. Right. Um, yeah. You know, I've done... WPF and Silverlight and Metro and WinUI and Xamarin and uh, Maui and I've, dabbed, I've played some with the WinUI and if you know one XAML, you basically know 
most of what you know to get a good start with the others. <laughs> I you think. did. I, absolutely. Right? I mean, they're not no. that different. They're no. way, way, way more the same than they are different. Yes, there's, you know, features and controls that might be in one or versus the other. And sometimes elements are called something different, but, you know. Yeah. And look, there are, there are some edge cases where, like, for example, you know, data binding multiple elements together and things like that, mm -hmm. where, you know, WPF has got a rich heritage of being able to support right. those more, sort of more esoteric kind of things. Um, and they were just never added to UWP or, or WinUI or Metro or, or any of those that sort of right. came after WPF. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason for that is because they're not a common scenario. They're not like, and people go on, oh, you know, UWP is not good because it doesn't do this or WinUI is not good because it doesn't, it doesn't have this, you know, particular XAML syntax that I want. And it's just like, well, right. yeah, okay, but you can work around that, you know, you know. Um, so that in most cases, there there are, are alternatives um, or better ways even of doing things in WinUI. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I don't find the you know the the competitive aspect of, of you know playing one against the other to be very beneficial at all. Right. Um, and I don't think Microsoft's recognised this. I mean, the, you know, for a while there, there was a lot of talk about WPF just going away and Microsoft wanted to move on. But, you know, recently we're seeing, you know, more support going back to supporting WPF and recognizing that developers should stay or, or can stay um, mm -hmm. where they're most comfortable. And, and, you know, if they've got a heritage in WPF and a lot of code there, um, does it make sense to restructure it for WinApp SDK? Probably not. Right. Um, you know, uh, not, not unless there's some really compelling story to go forward with. Right. What about... Uno and F sharp. Uh, that's a good one. Um, I, I must admit, that I think that right now we're C sharp, C sharp focused. Um, I I would divert to someone like Jerome who might have a better answer for that. Um, okay. If you're interested, just po post on our GitHub repository, and um, you know, the, um, Jerome and, and Francois might be able to respond on that. So okay, all right, cool, cool. Um, okay. So uh, the next thing to, to, to touch on is MVUX for state management. So this is our, our sort of more reactive approach to um, how we go about managing the state of the, the current page, for example. Um, and so here you can see basically this is a very simple model that we would use to back onto, say, a, a simple counter. Um, so we've got a you know the counter, which is currently the current value. We've got a step or an increment value, um, and then we've got a method that designed to basically increment the, the counter. Um, and so the idea here is that this can be very easily data bound. Um, it does. It's it's very declarative nature. Um, it, it's async supported um, and, it's, and it's immutable in the sense that as things change over time, you're not recreating the things like the counter. It's a, it's a, it is a property that has a singular value um, that just changes its internal value over time. And so is the idea here is that it's... During the running of the app or literally in between running of the apps? Is it stored so locally really, on disk or equivalent? Yeah, it's it's in memory. So it's okay. yeah. So it's, so just to be clear, it's it's state management for the running app as opposed okay. to data management or data persistence. Um, so yeah, so it's very equivalent to sort of the space that MVVM plays in terms of mm -hmm. you know I've got a page, I want to you know back my data onto there and use data binding. Um, but the challenges we often find with data binding in MVVM MVVM space is that you have to write a lot of code. Not the least of which is the you know the implementation of inotify property change, but even beyond that, you know if you want to do things like say you've got um, you're going to go and fetch some, fetch some data, so now all of a sudden you have to track a variable that says hey I'm I'm in progress and I'm looking up data and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and so this the sort of the 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 advantage of MVUX is that we have a model that, that wraps around that that, that will expose that information. Um, and so it just makes it much easier uh, to to wire that with minimal amount of code. Okay, so, okay cool. Yeah. Um, okay, one of the big improvements that we had, uh, actually, this is, this stems out of the, the, a lot of customer feedback that we had, is that you know there was the core Uno itself, which is obviously the nuts and bolts that you need in order to build an application. But then the team were working on a whole bunch of other stuff that we had the toolkit, we had extensions, and we had, you know, recipes for this, that, and the other. And it was like people were, 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 weren't aware of this. And so, you know, we'd point them at a resource and they go, okay, well, how do I get started with this? 
And so this leads us down the path of creating a, a, a wizard um, that we were we decided to back on a .NET new template. So you can run this from either within Visual Studio uh, using the you know the create new project syntax, uh, or you can actually run it from the command line, just you know newing up a, a, a new .NET new template. Um, now the, the problem with doing newing up a, a .NET new template is that there are a lot of different options. And as we get into this uh, in the demo, I'll actually show you some of these options. Um, but there's you know there's like ten or so pages worth of these different options that you can configure. And so you know if you go .NET new dash the Uno app and you do .dash h, um, it'll actually show you like pages and pages of the different options that you can then specify. So. So, okay. you know, we don't expect people to, to know all of those .NET CLI commands. Um, and so, you know, we'll see two things. We'll see the Visual Studio wizard, and then we'll also see the, the, the live wizard that um, is, is a, um, a web application where you can go and it'll actually walk you through the same process that you'd see in the Visual Studio wizard. But at the end of the day, you just get a CLI command that you can then run from the command line to generate your application. So, Cool. I mentioned before, um, we've got a lot of a lot of improvement around the ability to hot reload. Um, so the idea is that you can run your application um, and make you know continuous changes to both the code um, and also the markup, um, and then your application will update and reflect that. Um, there are obviously limitations. So if you're adding new files to your your your, your project, um, you may need to do a rebuild at that point. Um, but the idea is that we'll try and minimize the number of you know stops and starts that you have to do while you're still building your application. Right. And with that, I think it's time to hop into a demo. Uh, okay, so we're going to do a couple of things here. Um, the first of which is we're going to actually walk through the the new um, project wizard uh, and just walk you through some of the options that are available. Okay, so let me go. Um, we're actually going to build a very simple calculator. Um, this is one of our workshops that you can get it online. Um, there's a Figma file for it um, and step step by step guides as to how you go about creating this from scratch. Um, for now, we'll, we'll do two parts of it. So we'll call this. Let me just call this calculator. Um, go ahead and hit the create button. Uh, so this is our, this is the new project dialog from within Visual Studio. If you're not familiar with it, um, we have already picked the Uno platform template, and this is what you get when you go into um, and start creating a project. Um, there is going to be a, a, some little changes to this um, as we go into the next release, um, and mainly to take advantage of the new solution and project structure. Um, upfront, you're, you're basically given two sort of almost preset um options so the first is blank the second one recommended um the recommended basically gives you a lot of the guidance and suggested best practices that, that we would sort of encourage uh for starting off your application so it includes things like mvux it um, uses the material theme you know those types of things it gives you testing projects etc um whereas the blank is basically like if you're coming from this and you already know what you want and you you've already got your own components that you're going to bring in um the blank's a great starting point because it is literally just bare bones here's the unit platform with your target target platforms um you can bring in whatever components you want uh now obviously if these two don't align with what you want to do you can hit customize on either of these you can treat both of these as a starting point uh go to the customize and basically now you can set through all of the different options that oh, we nice. have and okay. customize it to your heart's content. So you can see here that over on the right, the summary of the, the options that are, are, are picked using the blank preset. Um, and we're just gonna go through these, um, you know, we'll go to presentation. Here, I'm gonna pick MVUX. Uh, so you'll see as we update that, it's updating in the summary on the, on the, the right-hand side. Uh, for markup, we'll go C-sharp. Uh, the theme will enable material, um, and we're gonna enable theme switching. So basically, you know, switching between light and dark theme. Uh, under extensions, we're actually not going to take advantage of any of these, but these are all but these extensions here are actually built on top of the Microsoft extensions. So, you know, if you want to use dependency injection, if you want to use configuration logging, all of those kind of base level things for your application, uh, you can enable this option and we basically pre pre configure that stuff for you. Um, and there's some optimizations specifically for the Uno platform. So rather than you just going and getting the Microsoft hosting um, and starting up, you know, using, you know, host.createBuilder, um, use the Uno platform one because we've got some optimizations for specifically for the, for the Uno platform. Uh, and then under features, we're gonna pick on the um, Uno toolkit. Um, and you'll see there's a bunch of other options there. Um, you know, you can bring in different authentication platforms, um, 
there's different testing options. Um, we even got some templates for both Azure pipelines and GitHub Actions. Nice. Yeah. So, we, you know, we really want to take you from design all the way through to almost build and publishing your application um, all from the get-go. Um, that actually add those to Azure DevOps services and GitHub or just give um, you the YAML? Hmm. You would use no it just it just gives you the, the yaml for it okay. um but you know the nice that's thing about github actions specifically is that if you just push that to your repository it'll pretty right. much just pick it up and, and yeah try and run okay. with it. so yeah cool. it's 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 a pretty nice to have as part of a, a a new template yeah um so i'm gonna hit create on this um it'll take a second or two to do its thing in visual studio um and then um yeah, we'll just have a quick look at the, the structure that it does create for us. Um, so we'll just give it a sec to finish off. Um, okay, so you, what we can see over there on the, 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 the right here um, is that we've got basically individual targets for the, 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 plat the target platforms that we're going to be targeting. So, you know, if I want to run on Windows, I'd set the Windows, you know, calculate.windows to be my startup project run it on Windows, I can pick GTK, so I'll do that right now. Um, that's going to start using the GTK target. Uh, and of course, for Canadian mobile, which is what? Sorry. So GTK is basically just a, a UI library that enables it to run um, cross-platform. So you okay. can you can run that that target on you know uh, Linux, Mac, uh, Windows. Um, so it's just a different like, rendering layer. Um, and actually going forward, we're actually looking at other options for that because GTK does require some components to be installed on the platform. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll tidy that up as part of the, the next wave. Um, so stay mm -hmm. tuned on that one. Um, the, the mobile target, uh, so that one is, um, does, it, it is the same as the single target for say Maui. So basically if you select that as your startup, you can then use the, the drop down at the top to pick between iOS and Android. Um, and as I know before, this is kind same. of subject. Okay. Sorry, go sorry. Ahead. Does it use the same pair to Mac and all of that? It does. Yes, okay. um, absolutely. So because right. we're built on, you know, .NET for iOS, .NET to Android, okay. you know, your Android emulators work the same way. You know, your iOS connection to, to Mac works the same way. Um, we've even got the ability to run directly on device from a Windows PC to, to the device, um, the same as the capabilities that, the you know, the Maui team have delivered. Okay. So, you know, so a lot of cool capability that comes with the platform there. Um, yeah. And by that, I mean the .NET ecosystem platform. Um, so, um, yeah, and look, so those, those are our target platforms. Um, and then we've got our, our, the actual application. So this is all our application logic. Um, and you can see if I click on the main page, you see that this is the basic layout for our page. I'll go ahead and hit, and hit run. Um, and so this will run the, the GTK target. Um, and we can go ahead and, and see that that will um, load up. We can start making changes to the, 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 the structure of our application. Has anybody started working on a markup to XAML converter to go backwards uh, and forwards? <laughs> no. I, I, well, a yes and no, sort of. There, there is one that we have. It's not something that we, we sort of really publish. Um, um, so we'll see in a minute the, the Figma plugin actually generates XAML. But of mm -hmm. course, we want to generate C sharp markup as well. So we do actually have some you know, logic there that actually will take the XAML and convert it to C sharp markup. Um, it doesn't seem like it would be that hard. Okay, so let me make a quick change to the, the C sharp markup here and hit save. And this is where the, I really got to trust the demo gods. Yeah, so there we go. Power reloads kicked in and it's basically pushed out the update to that. Cool. Now, I'm not going to recode the entire calculator. Um, so I'm actually going to switch to one that we've already got pre prepared. But I created this project the exact same way, um, just using the, the, the wizard. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, it's got a little bit more code on it. So I'll just run up this target and we can see what the output looks like. So while that's running, Sergio has asked, can you code on Mac OS? You most certainly can. Yes, we have uh, the VS Code. Um, you can use that to basically build the, the platforms, you know, build and run for the Mac OS platform. So basically, you should be able to build Mac Catalyst, iOS, and Android. Um, yeah. 
Cool. Uh, so here is our not so simple cal <laughs> calculator. <laughs> um, let me just try that again because I want to divide that and put that onto there. Let's actually see if my page splitting is not going to work for me today. I'll just do it manually. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so this, this is our calculator running. We've basically got it split. So there's a header at the top, um, there's an output and key pad at the bottom. Uh, and actually what I'm going to do is basically just hide these placeholders uh, like so and enable the actual real deal um, there. And, and, and while that's reloading, um, we'll just scroll down here and you can see that these, okay. these methods okay. for header, <coughs> output and keypad um, are literally just methods, right? So, you know, we don't have to stick to a single block. We can break it out. We can treat almost whole, whole code blocks as if they were sort of reusable controls. So for example, if I come down to the keypad, so let me just go to the definition on there. Um, let's try that again. Um, you can see here that essentially the keypad is basically made up of a series of rows. Um, and each of those rows got a number of buttons on them. The buttons are basically just another call to a method. And so wow. here, if I got a definition on those, this is returning a button, but basically it's a styled button. So again, instead of having to build up a complex style in XAML and stuff like that, I've just created a reusable method and just called it multiple times. And so it, it lends itself to a very easy way of creating reusable components. Um, that is really cool. So, and you it, can, so you don't have to learn XAML. Exactly. And now the weird thing there is that uh, like, whilst you don't need to learn XAML and essentially the only bit of XAML that you're not learning is the angular brackets because the markup structure is basically the same. Yeah. The elements are the same. The properties are all the same. I mean, it, it, you're, you're still going to learn all of that stuff. Um, but yes, you're saving, you're saving some, yourself some angular pain. <laughs> um, okay. Now I've, I've already got a, a data model pack, uh, signed up, uh, well, set up here. So basically, you can treat this as our data context. So if I go nine times nine, you can actually see that the calculator is now functioning. Um, if I go to definition on that, I'll see that my main model is essentially sim uh, um, made up of this state as a calculator. Um, and so as we're inputting values, essentially, all we're doing is calling the update method on the calculator that's returning a new instance of the calculator. And so, you know, we're, we're treating with these immutable objects and those are then passed through to the UI without us having to implement iNotify property change all the time. Um, now, I mentioned that I wanted to do theme switching. Currently, this button up here is not working. So I'm actually going to change our constructor here for our main model. I'm going to comment that one out and I'll um, uncomment this one. And so you can see here that this one actually takes a theme service. So this is actually coming from our toolkit. Um, and so, you know, um, we're going to, obviously that's going to take a different, well, it's a different constructor. So it's got to take a parameter. If I were to hit save on this, hot reload is going to throw, it, throw a tantrum and basically say, oh, I can't compile everything. So I can't reload. Um, so that kind, of answers, that kind of answers Sasha's question. Oh. Did I use hot reload? Yes, I am using hot reload. So. Yeah. But I also I saw theme a question from Francois. That's uh, it's more of a statement than a question. He's yeah. basically saying, does XAML and C-sharp markup okay. share the same object model? Yes, they do. Um, and so, you know, behind the scenes, it's, it's all the same thing. I mean, we're not inventing a new language, really. Um, you know, it's a different syntax, yes, <laughs> sort of, in the sense mm -hmm. of the, you know, the, the structure is still basically the same. Okay. Uh, okay. So I, I just saved on that. Um, in fact, I saved all of it. Um, and hopefully our, data, our theme switching is now working. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Hello, Tata and Francois, by the way. Good to see you guys. Yeah, I talk, the whole team's queuing in. Sasha's awesome. there, Francois's there. <laughs> so it's all good to have you here, there, heckling yeah, from cool. the crowds. <laughs> uh, it's all good. Okay, um, so let's just move on a little bit. We've, we've obviously got the foundations of Uno is quite uh, so rich in the sense of we, it comes from WinUI. We've got support for a lot of the, in fact, all of the, the main controls that people would use. Um, if you take a look at that, it's a pretty massive list of controls that are available out of the box in terms of the controls and components you can use. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, there are a bunch of you know non-UI APIs that we can, we can look at. Um, so things like network connectivity, you know, 
Um, those those types of sort of not UI related things, that those all come from that platform as well. So we have to take advantage of those. Um, and, and as I mentioned, we use those as an abstraction across the other platforms in terms of, you know, you don't have a separate set of APIs for Android and iOS for those types of things. You basically use the standard set of APIs. We also have um, some third party components, so rich toolkits, um, both from the community, so the Windows Community Toolkit, uh, as well as the, the Uno Toolkit. Um, and these are bringing together, you know, controls that just make your life easier. So we recognize that WinUI is very much a desktop based, um, you know, first sort of mm -hmm. language or set of controls. Um, so, you know, because we want to su support mobile, uh, things like the navigation bar need to be there because that's something that everyone's going to take advantage of. And so, you know, if you want to use those types of controls, um, the UNO toolkit's there for you. We also have a bunch of helpers, um, both within, as in, again, the, the UNO toolkit, but also the community toolkit. Um, and these are designed to just make things easier. So for example, We've got helpers for the safe area. So, you know, that little bar at the top that, you know, depending on what device you're on, could be a little circle or it could be a big wedge. Um, you know, the safe area allows you to basically annotate the, the in XAML or C-sharp markup. Um, and basically, you don't have to do anything. It automatically insets things appropriately, so you don't need to worry about that. Cool. Uh, I mentioned there's some non-UI things, you know, a whole host of those for dealing with things like file storage all the way through to, you know, the clipboard and, and those types of things. Um, and and I, I'll show you a great little site that one of our team has built that actually sort of showcases those. Um, actually, why don't we just do that now? Let's actually pull that up. Uh, so let's switch across. So this is the um, unexpected APIs, Azure websites.net. Um, and so this is a great little example. So this is a the network page, if I go observe connectivity and I bring up just the dev tools here, I can basically set the, um, the network to, let's change my throttling to offline and we'll see that it now appears as offline. Um, I change that back to no throttling and it recognizes it back online. So that's just a, a, a you know very cute little thing there. But going beyond that, like things like the accelerometer work. So I can set that to um, observe accelerometer reading. I'm actually on a laptop. So as soon as I move my laptop, it'll actually pick up those readings. Yeah, cool. And remember, this is all working in the browser. So this yeah. is a you know, app running in the browser, taking advantage of all of the sort of the modern interop that's available um, for that. So um, nice. it's pretty clever stuff. Uh, I, going beyond the, the the base set of APIs, I think one of the, the you know the other areas we spend a lot of time on is the sort of the extensions model. And so this is this builds on what Microsoft is doing in the Microsoft extensions. It does you know core things like dependency injection, configuration, logging, uh, HTTP access, localization, those types of things. Um, just making that, that your your developer story easy. Um, mm -hmm. And so you know this is a an add-on, um, so you can take advantage. You can pull off the bits that you want to use. So you don't have to take everything. You can start with dependency injection, just pull in, say, configuration. Um, and then as your application proceeds, if you want to bring in, you know, HTTP to make better use of calling third-party APIs, you can do that as well. We do have a couple of you know, key blocks that sit on top of it. The first is uh, navigation. And so out of the box, WinUI has a very limited kind of vocabulary for doing navigation. So you get a frame, you can navigate between pages. All is good, except that most applications aren't that simple. You know, a lot of the the, the WinUI based ones have a, a you know a nav view that sort of sits on the side and it sort of pops out. Um, so and then you know if you're on a mobile device, you quite often have a, t a tab bar at the bottom or you have the burger menu. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different sort of paradigms that you can do navigation with. Um, so we you know the navigation as part of extensions. Um, provides a singular, singular abstraction across all of those. And it doesn't matter whether you're doing it in XAML, code behind, or within your view model. You can use the exact same sort of abstraction to navigate between pages, between tabs. Um, and so it's a, it, it provides a nice sort of abstraction across those um, and handles things like data passing forward into between pages, as well as returning data from pages or flyouts or pop-ups and those types of things. So it provides a sort of fairly comprehensive approach to dealing with navigation. Cool. And then the other area is authentication. And so one of the most painful things to get set up in an application um, is often authentication. And so there's two parts of that. There's firstly, hey, I just need to pull in the right bits, you know, whether it be a package or app or whatever. Um, I need to configure it correctly. And then I need to basically call the login prompt. So that, that's the simple part. 
But then you actually need to think about, okay, well, how do you then deal with navigation? How do you, you know, navigate between the login prompt? How do you fall back to the login prompt if the user needs to be logged out? How do you then take the token that you've got from, say, authentication and apply that to calling services, those sorts of things? Right. So the authentication module as part of extensions deals with all of that. It works with OIDC, it works with um, MCEL, uh, you can use uh, simple web authentication, um, and then you can, if you've got your own custom protocol that you want to use, you can do that too. Um, so it's kind of designed to, to cater for a lot of the common scenarios, uh, and, and it's extensible. So if you have your own one that you want to build your own little module for, you can do that as well. Uh, and there good documentation on how to use that? There is, yeah. Okay, um, the starting point would be the Visual Studio um, template because, <laughs> uh, you know, what you get out of there is basically you, you get not only the package references, but you also get, you know, configuration set up to pull the information from the app settings. Uh, you also get a basic sort of navigation flow that basically just illustrates how you can, you know, walk between the different pages and then fall back to the login page if you need to be logged out, for example. Okay, cool. So, um, I mentioned third-party controls. Um, so there are some third-party uh, vendors that support the UNO platform. Um, so most of these work across all of our target platforms. Um, and then if you if they don't cater for what you need and you want to go something more advanced, you can pick up a lot of the Maui um, vendor platform uh, controls as well. So things like Telerix, Infusion, DevExpress, et cetera. Um, basically, any control that will work on Maui, you can use Maui embedding to actually pull those and bring those um, to the UNO platform. Oh, so, okay. so this this widens our scope dramatically. Um, but the, the caveat to that is that by doing that, you are limiting the platforms that that part of your application will work on. Um, so, for example, if you, if you picked up one of the sets of controls that only works on iOS and Android, it, that page or that area might only work for those platforms. It doesn't mean your whole application won't work everywhere else. Um, mm -hmm. It just means that those parts are obviously not render on, on the other platforms. So. Okay. So are some of those guys working on controls that directly support Uno, or are they just relying on the Maui embedding? <laughs> well, we're definitely, we're definitely working with all of those partners to try and encourage them to, to do that for, for the better experience. Um, yeah. But by the same token, we're also working with them to make sure that their story for Maui embedding is a rich one and, and yeah. fully supported for Uno platform. So. Cool. Um, look, at the end of the day, we're all about building beautiful looking applications. Um, you know, we, we put a lot of work into not just the fluent um, language that comes from Microsoft, um, making sure that's supported everywhere. Um, we've also put a lot of work into the material <clears throat> um, support because we recognize that that's probably one of the most commonly used sort of design languages for building applications. Um, and so if you look at the support, the work we've done in Figma, there's a big material toolkit there um, and the plugin, that's all working in that material space and designed to work there. Um, and so what I wanted to do is just quickly show you a demo of that. Let me just switch to this. So, um, so this is the UNO gallery. Um, and so if you come here, you can basically take a look and, and switch between the different um, supported theme libraries. Um, and you can actually take a look at the different styles of buttons that are available, the different styles of controls. Um, one, of the, one of the best demos that I think we created was when we added the support for shadow containers. So the ability yeah. to basically add shadows to virtually anything. Um, we've got this shadow builder which essentially allows you to add and remove shadows to an element and then control you know, things like the offset. So I can come in here and basically say, okay, I want uh, this to be five and five, um, maybe increase the blur to 50. Um, and actually I only want the one shadow so I can remove that. Okay, so I can completely configure that. And then I can take a look at the XAML that I've just created. And so I can literally copy that XAML into my application and mm -hmm. all of a sudden I've now got this funky sort of drop shadow on the controls that I want to do. Cool. And this gets particularly cool if you then take a look at, let me just close this up. Um, we've actually got a whole new uh, neumorphic style. And so you can see here that if I select on button, you can see that these are sort of these styles that you can generate using just this, this ability to, to put a, a drop shadow on things. You can create these very, very funky looking buttons um, that almost look 3D in nature. And so hmm. that's very creative. Uh, the other demo or the other thing I really wanted to show um, is the, um, the Figma support that we have. Okay, so yeah. um, as I mentioned, we do have a bunch of different um, files that are available. So we have, um, you know, 
Fibra files for a lot of the, the workshops, so simple cow, two player, etc. Uh, the core line, the material toolkit that's available is the Uno platform material toolkit. Uh, and this should be the starting point if you're going to use the, um, the, the use uh, or want to use Figma for designing for Uno platform. And this basically brings together a rich support for the materials design language, coupled with the, the sort of the naming conventions and the and the controls and elements from the Uno world. And so what we see here, so this is an example of it. Um, so this is basically what you get um, if, you, if you create an instance of the material toolkit. Um, you see here, we've got a sample application. You can see a lot of the controls, the styling. Um, it doesn't come in green. Um, it, it comes with, I think, a default purple or something. Um, I accidentally styled it green and I haven't reverted it. Um, there's getting started documentation. So this gives you a walkthrough for the file. Um, and then you can drop into the various low level elements. So you can hear, you can style and take a look at the different theme colors that are available. You can actually click on any of these and go, come over to the grid and basically say, okay, I actually want to customize this. Um, and so I can go, let me go try and edit that. And I can go, okay, well, let's make this a pink or a red. Um, okay, and all of a sudden, everywhere that that's used will now be a red. So you can see if I zoom out, you can see that that's been applied everywhere um, across this this document. Now, obviously, there's a lot of different um, colors here, and because I've created set this to red, it's going to really clash with this green that I've got. So I'm going to have to go through every single one of those. So we don't actually recommend, other than doing some very subtle tweaks, um, going and individually doing those. Um, the alternative is that you can actually go to the Figma plugin. Uh, and we actually support in here a ability to do a DSP import. Um, DSP is, let me go to, uh, let's just go to the material builder. He says, hoping, hoping that he brings in the right file. Um, sure. So, so this is Material Theme Builder. Um, so I can come in here and basically set my primary colors. So let's pick that red again. Um, or not red. Let's just adjust these to give me a different color, and we'll go close on that. Um, from here, I can then go export Material Token, so DSP format. Okay, so that's exported now. Um, I can then come back to my Figma file and go under Properties. He says under application, import DSP theme. And there it is. I can go open and confirm on that. And then when I take a look at my application, you can see that I've now applied that and changed the oh. entire theme of my application. So that, that's pretty super powerful. Um, and just whilst we're here, I just want to show you quickly how you go about exporting um, data from here. So we come into here again using the Uno platform plugin. And you come over to here, select a page. You'll actually see in, in the first tab, you'll actually get a live preview of, of the uh, application. And so essentially what's happening here is we're taking the Figma design, we're actually converting it to XAML, we're loading it using, you know, into the running Uno platform application um, and showing you a live application or a live page within this application. So if I put the cursor in here, you can see I can interact with it. You know, for example, I, obviously it's not bound to any data, so I can't navigate anywhere. I can't do anything like that with it. But the idea is you can see the different states. So for example, if I clear the contents here, I can see what the state of that, te that text box is gonna be when, there's no, when it's got no data in it. If I come across to the export tab, I can pick between XAML uh, or c -sharp markup. And so if I click on there, you can see that basically yeah, this is the same sort of c -sharp markup yeah. that we had um, back in the running application that we were working mm -hmm. with. So. Very cool. Lots of exciting stuff. So I actually touched on a couple of those demos already. Um, so kind of leave, leave us with this, um, basically the most productive .NET platform. Um, the only other thing I will call out is that we do have um, quite a lot of customers now picking up the Uno platform. And I guess I just want to call attention to one of the, the most recent stories that we had, which is that um, uh, Toyota is actually looking at migrating their existing mobile apps across the Uno platform. So it's great to see some big names actually picking up the Uno platform and going mm -hmm. with it. So, yeah. Um, and with that, got some 
bunch of resources for people. Yep. So getting started, um, the workshops I mentioned. Uh, if you need support, we've always got that. Um, we've also got a, a new video series called um, Uno Tech Bytes. Um, so I check those out. They're like two or three minute individual things focused on particular topics. Cool. Um, and we've also got a new um, Discord uh, server. So if you want to get, you know, interact with the team, have some suggestions or just get some feedback, uh, feel free to jump on the Discord server and, and reach out to us. Always cool. willing to have a chat. All right. So we do need to shout out to Martin. Hello, Martin. Hey, Martin. Martin actually was the first one on Visual Studio Toolbox to show us Uno. Nice. In, yeah. uh, gosh, it would have been sometime in 2020, if I believe. Because he's All the right. first person who showed it to me at a conference. Yeah. And I said, this is so cool. we got to get this on Toolbox. So Martin yeah. kicked off this whole Uno on Toolbox thing. So shout yeah. out to him. Indeed. Fuel has another question. What is the underlying engine? Lots seem to use Skia now. Um, so we, we do use Skia. Um, so you would have seen the, the GTK target that we had. That's, that is Skia based um, for the other platforms. So iOS and Android, those make use of the underlying uh, you know, controls that are coming from the platform. Um, so, so fundamentally, we're kind of a similar approach to, to Maui. Um, in the sense that we pick up the underlying controls and we use those to render the UI. Um, the big difference is that we kind of, we make sure that things are pixel perfect so that you get the same UI across all of the platforms, um, as opposed to Maui, which basically picks up the, the sort of the default style for those controls for the individual platforms. So subtle differences in, in, in the approach there. Um, but yeah, we don't, we don't do custom rendering for those platforms. Um, and then how is the OpenGL support? Uh, very good question. I'd have to take that on note and, and post a link. Um, post, post on GitHub and we can provide uh, more information. Sorry, it's not something that I'm particularly across at the moment. So. OK. Cool. Um, that Those are the questions. Yeah, awesome. So uh, thank you so had much for not <laughs> showing this. Uh, it's a very, very cool tool. and. I think it, you know, even if you are used to the Xamarin Maui approach, you know, it would be easy to pop back and forth. And um, I think my, you know, I'm going to write a new simple app, you know, it'd be fun to write it in Uno um, for starters, and then, you know, take everything I already know and apply it to the new platform, use the new tool, yeah. use the, the unique tooling in it. So, you know, I think it's to get started is pretty darn simple, and those yeah. workshops are cool. Yeah, no, look, the, the workshops are good. Um, you know, there's a there's a couple of them um, that are available off the the documentation site. Um, so starting from just a basic counter that's available in <laughs> XAML, C sharp, MVUX, and MVVM. So it's like four different permutations of that. Okay. Um, and then we've got Simple Calculator and, and Tube Player that are a little bit more fully fledged. Okay. Um, in terms of so this is, we do have an interesting question. Basically, what if you just want to build an app for the desktop? Uh, do, you um, have, do you have to download yes. all the mobile SDKs? Is, is there any so, reason not to use Uno if you're just targeting the desktop? No, not really. I mean, the, the, I mean, the nice thing about the Uno platform is it comes with all the flat platform bits, like extensions and toolkit and stuff like that. Um, I, I don't see a reason why you would need, like if you're just targeting desktop, you don't really need all of those. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the layer that Uno adds for, say, WinApp SDK and WinUI is fairly minimal. Um, we do have some, some pretty good tooling coming in the next release um, that just makes the things a little bit nicer in that space. Um, but obviously things like the toolkit and the extensions and stuff like that uh, all work across those targets. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely encourage, encourage people, even if you're starting just a WinUI, WinApp SDK based project, um, I would start with the, with the wizard. <laughs> Basically pick the bits that you want, just pick you know, WinApp SDK as the, the, you know, the target platform. Um, and that, that'll give you a good starting point uh, for sure. Um, and maybe down the maybe down the line, you'll decide that you want to port to the web or port to mobile devices as well. Yeah. And so at that stage, you can add those targets. So. Right. Cool. Thanks so much, Nick. That's awesome. Yeah, Thanks again for getting things. up so right. early to to be on the show. Well, I'll give you the, I'll give you the secret. I haven't been to sleep. Ah. <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm, a, I'm very much a late night owl now. <laughs> 
<laughs> Excellent. All Excellent. right. So thanks so much. Thanks everybody for watching. And thanks, we, everyone. Will, we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.